By some estimates, there were more than 1,200 deaths last year as a result of the use of force by police in this country. Nearly half of these were people of color. Eric Garner, Michael Brown, Tamir Rice, Freddie Gray, Walter Scott, Sandra Bland, Alton Sterling, and more recently, Keith Scott in Charlotte, North Carolina, and Terrence Crutcher in Tulsa, Oklahoma, are only a few of the casualties that have been graphically caught on camera and televised nationally. It is little wonder then that many in the minority community, including those in the Black Lives Matter movement, believe that police departments around the country suffer from institutional racism and systemic bias. Many fear the very institution that is supposed to be there to protect and serve them. This distrust and anger often leads to mass protests against the police, and at times, this has become violent, such as the recent riots that have rocked communities in Charlotte, Milwaukee, Ferguson, and elsewhere. For their part, police officers often feel besieged, targeted by camera phone crusaders, social media, and a 24-hour news cycle that sometimes sensationalizes even innocent mistakes made by officers who serve under extraordinary pressures and often risk their lives to protect others. Unfortunately, police officers have themselves, both black and white, now become targets of retaliatory violence. Just a few years ago, you might remember four officers here in Washington were ambushed and killed while sitting in a coffee shop. Two police officers in 2014 were killed execution style while sitting in their patrol car in New York City. And just a few months ago, five police officers in Dallas, Texas, were ambushed and killed while responding to a call. So against this backdrop of violence and distrust, race and policing has become a major issue, even in the presidential candidate uh, debate last night. You might have heard they sparred over things like what should be done about stop and frisk policies. They have, not surprisingly, I guess, express starkly different perspectives on the nature of the problem and what should be done about it. So perhaps there's no issue that is more timely for us to be examining today than race and policing, and I look forward very much to our discussion. We are fortunate to have with us a wonderful panel of national experts on this topic, as well as representatives from important local constituencies who are involved. Now, I've asked each of our panelists to spend about 10 to 12 minutes uh, in uh, their preliminary remarks in order to provide us some information and some context for our conversation, after which we will have time for questions and answers from the audience. I'm going to introduce each of our speakers as they uh, speak to us in turn. We will begin the discussion today uh, with Dr. Lorenzo Boyd. Uh, Dr. Boyd is the president of the Academy of Criminal Justice Sciences and the chair of the Department of Criminal Justice at the University of Maryland, Eastern Shore. Dr. Boyd has been an educator and an academic for over 15 years and started and developed the master's program in criminal justice at Fayetteville State University and the University of Massachusetts Lowell. Before becoming an academic, Dr. Boyd served as a Suffolk County, Massachusetts Sheriff Deputy for over 12 years. He earned his bachelor's degree from the University of Massachusetts in sociology and political science and a master's degree from the University of Massachusetts at Boston, where his research explored the effectiveness of community corrections programs. His doctorate he earned in sociology from Northeastern University, where he specialized in urban policing. Please join me now in welcoming Dr. Boyd. Thank you very much. First of all, I'd like to thank the Foley Institute and Washington State University for inviting me out. It's, it's truly a pleasure to be here. And let me start off by saying, go Cougs. <laughs> you try that again. Go Cougs. Go Cougs. Holla back. <laughs> I also want to give a special shout out to the African American uh, Student Center. And I went up and visited them. So anybody here, just kind of wave and show me where you are. Thanks for coming out. I appreciate it. Let me start by talking about part of the problem. When we talk about policing in general, 
We look to the research and we can see a former New York City police officer and policing scholar, Jerry Skolnick, in his book, Above the Law, he talked about what police officers look for when we're looking for, quote, the symbolic assailant. He describes these people as undesirables, and you can tell these people by the way they dress, their clothing, their hair, their mannerisms, their, their language. It's an indication of danger. Part of the problem is the underlying auspices of policing in general is an us versus them scenario. Let me also say that when we have panels like this and we invite police officers to come out, like Captain Taylor here, clearly the people that come out are the progressive people who get it and who understand. There are some officers out there who still don't get it and are still missing the point. When we talk about policing, way too often the police identify in their warrior role and not enough in the guardian role. When we talk about policing, sometimes we spend way too much time on law enforcement and not nearly enough time on keeping the peace. We have to go back to what policing is supposed to be. Back in the days of Sir Robert Peel, when he said, the community is the police and the police are the community. Officers are actually trained to cultivate that warrior mindset. It's us versus them. And the police are the protectors of freedom and liberty. Unless, of course, you choose to take a knee during the national anthem, and then you can't have that liberty. So we kind of get to pick and choose which level of liberty you're allowed to have. And when you talk to officers, ultimately they say, at the end of the day, I have to get back home to my family. And officers would inevitably tell you, at any point you could lose your life. It's life or death. You never know on the next stop what's going to happen. Well, the truth is, policing is in fact dangerous, but it's not Beirut. It's not Syria. That's not what we're talking about on the streets of America. When we look at policing, when I talk to police officers, when I do police trainings, we talk about how dangerous policing is, and people are quick to tell you how many police officers are killed in the line of duty. Well, I'm a criminologist. Let's kind of put this in perspective a little bit. There's over 780,000 sworn officers in this country. And when you look at fatalities, Last year was one of the safest years for policing, going back to the Reagan administration. So when we hear there's a war on police, well, factually, that's not correct. If you look at policing over the last generation or so, fatalities in policing are actually going down. And here, the shot that I have here, it's not felonious assaults. There are police officers dying in the line of duty, including motor vehicle accidents, suicides, motorcycle accidents. So when the media tells you that there's a war on police, that's just not accurate. When we look at fatalities, you can see a downward slope. It's actually getting safer. Part of it is because of the equipment, part of it is because of community relations, part of it is because police officers are doing a better job engaging so when police officers are telling you that it's life or death and at any given point, well, yeah, I guess that is true because there are some days when I went out in uniform, I kind of felt that. But the truth is, it's safer to be a cop now than virtually any time in recent history. But let's fast forward to why we're here because we do know the media keeps telling us that the police have been killing unarmed people of color in record number. I guess there's some reasons for that. We can talk about that, but let's look and see what this looks like. Unarmed black people are killed five times as often as anyone else in our society. So if there is an epidemic of people getting killed, 
I think the numbers are skewed more in this direction. This still doesn't talk about the problem because this is a symptom of a much, much larger problem. So if there are people that should be afraid, typically it's not the police. I've got a good quote for you. I shared this in a uh, policing class yesterday in criminal justice, one of my favorite quotes to use. Justice is blind, represents the basic model of the criminal justice system. It symbolizes equality in the administration of justice and represents the basic rights in a free society. But for many in the minority community, however, society is not that free, and justice is far from blind. Justice, in many cases, has 2020 vision that distinguishes people on the basis of race or ethnicity or gender or religious belief or socioeconomic status. And when I put something like this up and when I ask a class, who said this? Was this Malcolm X? Was this Minister Louis Farrakhan? Was this Al Sharpton? No, it wasn't. Police officers said this. This came from the National Report of the National Organization of Black Law Enforcement Executives. Police captains, deputy commissioners, commissioners, police chiefs realize that there's a problem in the system and they're willing to stand up and say that this is so. When we talk about systemic bias, although African Americans constitute roughly 14% of the American populace, they constitute roughly 50% of all police arrests. That's a problem. African Americans in this country are more likely in virtually every city to be arrested more often for virtually every crime. So why is that? Are African Americans more criminal, as some would easily say? But no, we're an educated audience. We know that there's something beyond that. Let's take a look at some of the issues. Let's talk about selective enforcement. We understand that there are some areas that we've already identified through CompStat or through hotspot policing as high, of having a higher level of crime. So because of that, we put more police officers there and they then tend to watch more diligently. The more you watch, the more you'll see problems. If there are two communities that have high rates of crime, one black, one white, Historically, because of what we saw in the symbolic assailant, if we put more police officers in the black community than the white community, inevitably, we're going to make more arrests of people of color. That's the way this systemic bias works. And then Wilson and Kelling in 1972 gave us broken windows. And they said crime is not the problem. Crime is symptomatic of a much larger problem in society. So if you fix the smaller problems, then the crime problem then goes away. And everybody said, oh my gosh, that's brilliant, let's do it. But broken windows morphed into zero tolerance policing. So now we see the police arresting for things that they otherwise wouldn't. We see the police arresting for things that would otherwise be let go. The Eric Garner case, when he was killed, he was selling loose cigarettes. He wasn't robbing a liquor store. He wasn't selling crack. He was selling loose cigarettes. And that was the result of his death. When we look at levels of incarceration, one million of the 2.3 million people incarcerated are black people, 44%. Remember, black people are 14% of the population. African Americans are incarcerated at a rate six times that of white America. And again, it's not because black people are six times more criminal than black America. It's systemic bias in the criminal justice system. When you look at juveniles, 44% of all the youth that are detained, 46% of the people taken from juvenile court into adult court, 58% of the people that are not given bail or probation are young people of color. There's a problem in the criminal justice system. 
And let's talk about my hometown, born and raised and educated in Boston. Spent my time in uniform in the city of Boston. The St. Clair Commission that investigated the city said that race plays a central role in the use of force. Race is a major issue in policing. So then there was a study done, conducted in the city of Boston by Boston police and in conjunction with the ACLU. Between 2007 and 2010, even though black people were roughly 24% of Boston's population, they accounted for 63% of everyone that was stopped and searched in the city. That in and of itself is problematic. In 2015, there's a total of 204,000 searches in the city. 204,000. Over 60% of them were people of color, particularly black people. What did we find from that study in 2015? 2.5% of all of the searches came up with contraband, weapons, drugs, something illegal. 2.5%. So being a criminologist, what does that tell me the other way? 97% of the time they were wrong. 97% of the people that were stopped and searched were done so for no apparent reason, or at least yielded nothing positive from it. So then the question is, why are all these people getting shot and killed? And when I talk to my policing friends, or the police supporters, they say to me, well, if they were to comply, if they didn't run, if they did what they were told, they wouldn't be dead. Now, let, let's take a, stop, take, take a step back and look at that for a minute. When I teach policing courses, or when I teach my criminal law course, the main issue in policing is the context for the stop. Why did you make the initial stop? If your context for the stop is wrong, everything after that is wrong. Legally, we refer to that as fruits of the poisonous tree. If you stop somebody for no apparent reason, regardless of what else is going on, everything after that is called into question. Everything else is suspect. The Massachusetts Supreme Judicial Court had a ruling a week ago that said simply being black and running from the police is not an admission of guilt. They said many times when black people are trying to elude police or trying to get away from police, it's not because they're guilty. Many times they're motivated by the desire to avoid the recurring indignity of being racially profiled as they are to hide criminal activity. You should comply, Freddie Gray. You should comply, Sandra Bland. You should comply. We can talk about all the people in custody that complied that ended up dead. So sometimes people are saying, it's worth it to take my chance running. But when we saw in North Charleston, South Carolina, when you run, you get six bullets in the back. Not all cops are like that. But it happens enough. I just did a, uh, a seminar, a forum for the National Sheriff's Association, and one of, the, uh, one of the commanders said to me, the problem is the media. The media keeps playing stuff over and over and over again. I blame the media. And I told him, if you didn't shoot and kill him, the media would have nothing to show. We have to talk about levels of accountability. So we move forward. Last point I'm going to make, President Obama put together a task force for 21st century policing. And in the task force, there were six pillars. Pillar number one, building trust and legitimacy, building relation between the police and the community. And if we delve a little bit into pillar number one, trust and legitimacy, here's the quote that I love. This whole 400-page document that I'm sure Captain has and has read a bunch of times. People are more likely to obey the law when they believe that those that are doing the enforcing have a legitimate authority to tell them what to do. The public confers legitimacy only on those that they believe are acting in ways that are procedurally just. It's about legitimacy in policing. Let me give you this last question. You're a police officer. Everybody put on your hat, you're a police officer and you're running radar, 
and you see a car driving down the street in the Palouse, speed limit's 55, they're doing 80 miles an hour. By a show of hands, how many people are likely to stop that vehicle and probably ticket them? Okay, so you walk up to the car, you're ready to give them a ticket, and pretty much you've got a bad attitude because you can't speed on my streets. You walk up to the car, the driver seems really, really nervous. You look at the passenger, woman in full labor, water just broke. Do you give him a ticket? Because something is legal to do, it doesn't mean it's the right thing to do. Police legitimacy. Thank you. Thanks, Lorenzo. Uh, our next speaker is Captain C.P. Taylor of the Tacoma Police Department. Captain Taylor graduated from Pacific Lutheran University where he earned his bachelor's degree in business and communication. Later in his life, he decided to pursue a career as a police officer, and he started his 25 years of service as an undercover agent. He now leads the Tacoma Criminal Investigations Division overseeing all detectives, undercover agents, forensics, and special ops. Captain Taylor has been instrumental in helping the the Tacoma Police Department reframe its policing philosophy from a standard rule-based approach to a values-based policing philosophy. Join me now in welcoming Captain Taylor. Thank you very much. It's, um, it really is a tremendous pleasure to be here. And as flattered as I am over the introduction, I must admit, uh, let's be clear, I did not spend 25 years in undercover capacity. <laughs> I spent a very small portion of that way back when I was a much younger man. I did, however, start this line of work at an elder age, considering most police officers. I didn't go into this field of work until I was 30 years old. I had spent an enormous amount of time in the private sector in a lucrative field in the financial research industry. But you know what? Like many police officers in this country, we decided to take up what I call a calling because it is noble. If you are utilizing legitimacy, for what you do and what you believe. You go into this field of work, not because you're gonna make money, not because you're gonna get fame, but because you know that somebody needs something that not everyone else can provide. And there's an errant gene in you somewhere <laughs> that perpetuates this need to run toward problem rather than away, which is a basic instinct of survival, right? You hear gunshots, how many of us are gonna run for cover? Hopefully all of us. Unfortunately, there's a few of us in this world that are compelled to go, oh my God, that bullet might hit somebody. I better go help. That is why I call this a noble cause. That doesn't mean that everybody in this world is perfect. Evil is perpetuated in this world in absolutely every age, every ethnicity, every geography. Um, it just is what it is. But how do we look at it? How do we give context to the things that we deal with that helps us determine what a legitimate what an integrity-driven outcome we arrive at. So what I'm going to talk about just a little bit here today is the fact that there are things that are very dynamic uh, that we're dealing with today. Some people would say we've never seen this before. I would argue we have. Sometimes these come in cycles. But certain types of technology bring it to the forefront much more readily than other times in our life. There were times in the 60s where what we're hearing about today was rampant. But how many of you know about it? Certainly very few of you were alive. And the media resources back then were so antiquated that you really didn't hear that much about it. Today it's everywhere because we have the ability to see it real time. And it brings it to the forefront and it forces us, and rightly so, to confront these things honestly, authentically, without standing behind a veil and dealing with it for both our sake and our kids' sake to come. So one of the things that we did, and again, I come from a small town in western Washington called Tacoma, and I have been there <laughs> in this agency for 25 years. And I did it because I thought at the age of 30, holy cow, I am so bored. <laughs> All I'm doing is making money for somebody else, and not one person that I made money for saved an old lady, helped anybody cross the street, got anybody's ill-gotten goods back or, some, or saved somebody from being victimized. And dang it, somebody needs that. That's that errant gene that I referred to early on. And thank God there is a modicum of 
generations and personalities throughout the whole world that possess that errant gene. But like you, I am a citizen. I am Citizen Taylor. The only difference between me and any of you sitting here is that I get paid to give full-time attention and responsibility to the things that we all face. But when I get home at night, I still play ball with my kid. I play, I mow my lawn. I shoot the breeze with my neighbor. I help push somebody out of the intersection. I pick up milk at the grocery store. I have the same squabbles and the same um, confrontations in daily life that we all have. I am you, and you're me. So what I do for a living doesn't make me above. It doesn't rise me above. It doesn't give me a front seat to knowledge or intelligence. It does give me a desire and a passion to do something about it and utilize the training I've been given. So we talk about that in procedural justice. That's not a new term. The concept itself has been around forever. But it is right. It is appropriate. The incident was brought up about what happens if you pull somebody over and they're doing 85 and a 70. You walk up to the car and the question was, have you already decided what you're gonna do? And if you have, what's that based on? Nobody's doing NASCAR in my town, right? The question is, what happens when you do see the mother or the wife in the passenger seat? who's about ready to deliver. Doesn't that add context to the occurrence? Does that or does that not give you pause and reevaluate your predetermined disposition to that traffic stop? I would submit that I hope so. We talked earlier this afternoon chit-chatting and one of the things that came up is it's when you go to the academy you get taught this pretty standardized curriculum about if this, then that. If this occurs, clearly the next step is on a matrix and you must provide X or Y. And they'll tell you, oftentimes, if you're gonna make a traffic stop, it's incumbent upon you as professionals to already know exactly what you're gonna do before you contact the driver. Why? Because it's a system you've developed. You know what occurred. You know the probable cause you had to make that stop. So clearly there's a disposition in front of you based on a matrix and you need to follow that. I never bought that. You have to give context to life. There are reasons people do what they do, and more often than not, they're for reasons that may or may not have been on your radar. You don't know everything. So in that vein, I'm gonna tell you just really quickly about something that our agency did that I really truly believe gives us a leg up on some of the areas and some of the messages and the themes that we've heard, particularly regarding Ferguson, Charlotte, Tulsa, and a number of others. We decided in 2006 <clears throat> that hundreds of years worth of police work, which is determined under a premise called rules-based policing, and that's the if this, then that premise. If this occurs, clearly the answer is B. But if B plus C occurs, I guarantee you, your answer better be H. You didn't have to think about it, you were just told as a matter of rote memorization, what your steps needed to be in order to maintain clarity, because you're not God. And that is the way police work has been in this country for a long, long time. And it still traditionally is. And we refer to it as quantitative policing. It's a numbers game in terms of if this happens, the process is such and such based on the things you've been taught or you've learned in a book, or the things you've been told that occurred in a court ruling. There isn't anything between the lines. It is what it is. We decided we didn't think life was clearly that way. We're all humans, we have the ability to think linearly, laterally, qualitatively, and that's where we decided to hang our hat. There's a concept called values-based policing. And what it means is what you do and how you affect your confrontations, whether it's peaceful or, or adversarial, or your conversations, or your exposure to anything and everyone needs context. There is something called the golden rule, folks, right? the Ten Commandments or what have you. Just be nice, do good to others, do what you want somebody to do to you or for you, and not different. Do you value yourself? Well, why shouldn't you value the person around you too and, and afford them the same courtesy? So we took this concept and we took 125 years worth of policy that was probably, I don't know, 700 pages thick, and we threw it in the trash can. And everybody said, what are you gonna do now? Well, 
we sat down and we thought about what we really thought an ideal police world might look like under a values-based concept. And that's inherently based on your intent. What's in your heart? Regardless what my circumstances are, regardless where I go or what the confrontation that I'm involved in, it involves context, good, bad, or indifferent. There isn't just good, neutral, and evil. There's everything in between. So give it context. What's your intent? What's in your heart? Do you want to do something good for somebody or not? And if you want to do something good for somebody, it drives the ultimate decisions you make. We're all going to make mistakes. Nobody's perfect, professional or unprofessional. Police officers or accountants or store clerks, we're all inherently failed, right? But we can recover. We can think about the decisions we make and why we made them and what our motives were behind them. So in our world, it's about motivation, what's in your heart. And we created them based on a set of core values. And you hear these a lot. Ours, I gotta be honest with you, they have meaning to us. It's about having integrity. It's about treating the guy across the street exactly as if it was your brother or your wife or your sister or you. It's about being courteous. It's about when you make a traffic stop and for whatever reason, they roll down the window and you walk in, they just start swearing at you. You think that could ever happen? Somebody in the car just starts throwing them out. I mean, words that maybe you've never even heard of before. And holy cow. You go, that, what, an, what, an, what an affront that is. I'm just me. What did I ever do to you to talk to me that way? And you get yourself all riled up, right? And it's an eye for an eye at that point. Well, if you're going to talk to me that way, by God, we're going to have a conversation we can both relate to, and it's the one you just initiated. And I start lambasting that person back. What have we arrived at? It's a bit of a test. What we have arrived at is I crossed a line. I was wrong. I don't have the convenience of responding back that way with that person, regardless what they did. Do you know why? Because I represent something. They have the constitutional right, as we all do, to say these things, whether I like them or not. That doesn't mean I have the right, as, a re as an official representative of my employer, to respond in kind. And if my employer says, don't treat people that way, treat them kindly, no matter what they say to you. Sorry, folks, I have a responsibility to be kind and courteous back, regardless what my inner voice might be saying. And I might go home and go, wow. OK, I've got to look those words up. The point is, courtesy has matter. It has value, and it has meaning, and it has depth. If you're not willing to walk the things that you've signed on for, then sign off and go do something else. So we embarked on this journey in 2010 is when we implemented a concept called values-based policing. And I want to give thanks to Lorenzo. He referred to somebody called Robert Peel. Anybody here ever heard of Robert Peel? I'll bet you a bunch, right? This is a long, long time ago, folks, in Great Britain. And while the words are not particularly probably authored by him, these constructs that were born out of this philosophy that he had are called Sir Robert Peel's Nine Principles of Modern Policing. And if you haven't read those, I strongly encourage you to look them up, because they're golden. There are nine concepts that we decided to base our world upon. And one of them is that we are the public, and the public is us. And as long as I'm here, it will only remain valid at the consent of you. The minute the folks in this room revoke the consent for me to represent you in this capacity, I absolutely must vanish. And that's really important. That's what causes this whole construct to work, that we're, that we're just representatives of you. We are citizens just like you. When you revoke that consent, we leave. He also says that you should only use physical force when absolutely all of your other capabilities were ineffective. And that means talking, leveraging, cajoling, <laughs> whatever it takes peacefully to try and find a common ground before you, have to revert, before you have to revert to something really violent. So I'm not gonna go into all nine, but I will tell you this. In the core of our particular department policy, we built the tenets of our department constitution surrounding those nine principles. And I think that's really something you'd be interested to look up. One of the other things that we did that I have yet to find this anywhere in the country, 
and that is our recognition that we don't know everything. I don't have an answer for everything, no matter how much you train me, because I'm not you when I face you and everything that you've gone through. What on earth do I do if I don't have an answer? Rules-based policing says I'm screwed, because I better have the answer. Fact is, I don't. So we said, you know what, in our policy, we may not have the answer to absolutely every situation that you, young officer, may come upon. Don't freak out. Don't quit. Here's what you do. Utilize the values and the core beliefs that we've taught you and make your best reasoned, integrity-filled decision based on those values. In the end, whether you made the perfect choice, made the right call, had the ace in the hole, or it could have been done better, all that's going to be mitigated, and rightly so, based on your heart and your intent. And if we fail to do that, we have relinquished our right to represent you. It is a choice. Procedural justice is imperative. Because if I get pulled over, I want to know why. And I certainly don't think I have the right to tell the driver, don't worry about it. Read it on the ticket. While that may be true, that's also rude, right? And that's not what we're here for. So that's really what I just wanted to start with. And I think that the dialogue that's going to occur here in just a few minutes and shortly is going to be really lively and dynamic. And I'm really hoping for that. So thank you very, very much. Thanks, CP. Our next speaker uh, will be uh, Philip Tyler. Uh, Philip currently serves as the president of the Spokane chapter of the NAACP. Mr. Tyler began his career in the United States Air Force, where he served for six years as a law enforcement specialist. After leaving the Air Force, he took a position with the Spokane County Sheriff's Office in their jail division, where he quickly rose in the ranks from a deputy sheriff to a lieutenant before resigning to go to work for the NAACP in Spokane, first as their vice president and now as the president of that organization. Please join me in welcoming Philip. Taylor. So after a while here, you're going to give an applause for these four gentlemen that are up here on the stage, myself included. But I need to start by saying this. Give yourselves, look to the left, look to the right, look to the back of you, look to the front of you, and give yourselves a round of applause for coming here and willing, be willing to have this courageous conversation that needs to be occurring in our society today. So give yourselves a round of applause for being here today. So I'm not going to talk too long, but what I am going to talk about is the police veil of secrecy, or what's otherwise known as the thin blue line, and how it relates to community relations. And before I start, my good brother over here brought up the indication of danger, if you remember that slide. How can individuals of color avoid this perception if the indication of danger, the weapon, is their skin. I want you to think about that before our discussion starts this afternoon. And my good friend CP brought up Robert Peel's nine tenets of policing. I'm gonna bring up one. That was 190 years ago today. Police need the public's trust. I'm gonna say that again. Police need the public's trust. Now raise your hands if you, like me, are tired of pushing that Sisyphean burden police community trust up the hill over and over and still landing in the same place we are today. Show of hands. Yeah, if you remember the, the myth, Sisyphus had to push this rock up a hill over and over for eternity. We don't have that strength and we don't have that time. We get tired, we get weary. Something has to change. And part of that change starts with this veil of secrecy in our police department. Now, now, there are many factors that contribute to this syndrome. Trust, split second decision making, protection, and an attitude that says, you can only understand what we are going through if you've lived the life of an officer. Well, we can acknowledge that to some extent, and it may be true, but too often this veil, this thin blue line is used as justification for misconduct. 
or justification of misconduct. Now, the 21st Century uh, Task Force on Policing that was been brought up earlier, it describes 21st century policing as an obligation of law enforcement not only to reduce crime, but also to do so fairly while protecting the rights of all citizens. Any prevention strategy that unintentionally violates civil rights, compromises police legitimacy, or undermines trust is counterproductive from both the ethical and cost-benefit perspectives. So let's focus on that ethical standpoint they talked about. Recently in Tulsa, Terrence Crutcher was shot. Another shooting of an unarmed black man. In this case, hands were raised. Yet again, the idea of civil rights violations, i.e. taking a person's life without justification, and police legitimacy, using lethal force, a firearm, in this case, perhaps based on sympathetic fire, and trust, immediately defending the officers and demeaning the citizen. And you've seen this time and time again. An unarmed person of color is shot, and they immediately bring up his or her past, as it's that somehow paramount to the situation that's going on today. It's not. And why do we continue to delve into the individual's past work history? Why isn't the officer at suspect for shooting? Why aren't we delving into his or her past immediately? That's the thin veil. That's that thin blue line. Secondly, why do cameras only tell the truth when it's from the perspective of the officer? It becomes empirical data, empirical evidence that the person of color was wrong. But if we look at it from the other angle, what they tell us is wait for all the facts to bear out. Camera angles are different. If Phil Tyler stands on the other side of the stage here, I might look different than I do over here. That's not accurate. I'll look the same. But if I'm defending a theory, I can wait. I can make you wait. So why is it so difficult for our law enforcement brothers and sisters watching around the nation to simply admit when something looks bad? A young black man in Chicago was shot 16 times, the majority of which were while he was lying on the ground. And not a single officer stood up and said, that looks wrong, or that is wrong. What they said was, there are differing camera angles. Let's wait till all the facts come out. The angle of videos are varying, and they don't tell the whole story. When the officer, the female officer, was charged by the prosecuting attorney in the shooting, the prosecuting attorney said this. The officer is in it, innocent, excuse me, until proven guilty. We can agree with that, right? The deceased, however, did not get due process. He was deemed guilty and sentenced in a split second and given a death sentence. Part of pulling back this veil of secrecy is procedural justice, and that would dictate humanizing the experience. What if that individual or those individuals that were shot were a part of the officer's family, were friends, were relatives? Would they view the situation differently? Would they be willing to stand up and say, this has to stop? We hear this narrative time and time again. Only 2 to 5% of the officers are bad ones. Then why don't the 98 and 95% stand up and point out the ones that are doing it wrong. Now let's go back to that President's Task Force on 21st Century Policing. One of the things that they said out of that report was, absence of crime is not the goal, the final goal. Rather, it is the promotion and protection of public safety while respecting the dignity and rights of all. 
Public safety and well-being cannot be attained without the community's belief that their well-being is at the heart of law enforcement activities. Does denial, secrecy, justification, and dissecting camera angles give the community belief that respecting the rights of all is at the heart of law enforcement officers? That's the question. And I'm not gonna stand up here and take much more of your time because I want this to be a dialogue, not a monologue. I'm not an, I'm not an academic, ladies and gentlemen. My life lessons were learned in the school of hard knocks, oftentimes in night class, and my mother can attest to that. I got involved in this process because I was tired of standing on the sidelines seeing what was going on in society. And I can look out in this audience and I hope that you have the same feeling as I do. Something must change. And we must be that ground swell of change for our society. And I thank you for being here and I look forward to our conversations and I leave you with this. Stay woke, Wazoo. Stay woke. Thanks, Philip. Uh, our final panelist today is uh, one of my colleagues, Dale Willits, who's an assistant professor in the Department of Criminal Justice here at WSU. Professor Willits earned his PhD from the University of New Mexico. His research interests explore issues related to policing, the etiology of crime, juvenile delinquency, and the relationship between place and crime. Dr. Willits is currently working on a number of different projects, including the analysis of violence and research which examines the role of social networks and crime-related re relationships. Dr. Willis. I, I want to summarize what we've talked about so far before diving into the main point uh, of my talk, which is really to sort of highlight some existing challenges moving forward, to think about what can we do about these issues, and what are we doing here at Washington State. But, but thus far, we've heard, I think, compelling evidence that there is a racial bias in policing. We've heard considerable evidence that some of this has to do with maybe what we might call police culture, the, the thin blue line, uh, the, the lack of transparency. And we were also fortunate to hear from um, Captain Taylor uh, uh, about an agency that's trying to preempt some of these issues that says, hey, let's not be Ferguson, let's not be Charlotte, let's try to, to fix the problems before they come up. And that's important because a lot of policing ends up being responsive. We, we, we try to fix things after the problems emerge, but it turns out that fixing things after they're broken is really hard. Not letting them get broken in the first place is generally a much better solution. So just to reiterate these challenges, and you'll note maybe a humorous aside for myself that Dr. Boyd and I are the academics on stage and we both like PowerPoint. <laughs> um, there's a lot of challenges moving forward. Some of those challenges are how do we change police behavior? Policing, like all organizations, are inherently difficult to change. Police are probably more difficult to change than the average institution. And there's a lot of research, some of this I've conducted, some of this I've conducted with my colleagues in the Department of Criminal Justice, that suggests that the change that happens is often ch happening in places that don't need it that much. So, so that's an ongoing challenge. How do we as my, my co-presenters have discussed, how do we improve community relations? Um, a very difficult problem. How, how do we improve the way the police see the community, the way the community sees the police? No easy answers there. And how, how do we encourage accountability and transparency? And unfortunately, I, I think unfortunately, my role on this, this panel is to be a little bit pessimistic um, and that is that we really don't know how to do those things yet. We, we have a lot of knowledge about the bias in policing. We have a lot of knowledge about the distribution of policing. And what I mean by that is that poor minority neighborhoods are over-policed. We, we have a lot of knowledge about that. We don't have a lot of good data on what works and how to move forward. And if our goal is to make improvements, if our goal is to, to envision a better future where the police and the community work hand in hand, where, where animosity is reduced, where the public is safer, where the police are safer, 
we'd like to make those decisions based on data, right? We'd like to say, oh, there's good empirical evidence that this is a strategy that makes sense. There's, there's good uh, reason to believe that this is how we should change how police operate or how we should incorporate the community into policing actions. But truth be told, uh, there isn't good data out there. I'm going to focus for a second, or I guess for the rest of the presentation, so a second was a lie, <laughs> on the use of force. I, I want to acknowledge before I do that that I think it's inherently dangerous to boil down the issue of police and race to the issue of use of force. There are all sorts of other things at hand here, including stops, the context for stops, the presence of police in neighborhoods, the resources given. All of those things are important. But clearly, use of force also matters, right? These, these events that we've talked about, these, these deaths, these, these tragedies, they were use of force issues. They prompted much of this current discussion. They were the result, or they, they were the cause of a lot of the public debate. So let's talk about police use of force. Our primary data source would be the FBI's supplementary homicide reports. This data is funneled through police departments to the national level to the FBI. And it has this element where you say, how many of these homicides occurred? And they can be justified or unjustified. And one type of homicide that can be included in there is the killing of a citizen by a police officer. This data is deeply flawed for that purpose. Now, it's flawed on two different levels. One, it's completely inaccurate. Uh, David Klinger, a criminologist, spent quite a bit of time looking at supplementary homicide report data as well as agencies' own internal records. And so, for example, he went to the Los Angeles Police Department and he looked at what they reported to the FBI, he looked at what they said internally, and those numbers weren't even close. And not only were they not close, they were systematically underreported. So the, the supplementary homicide report undercounts violence by police. And given, as, as, as Lorenzo said, that much of violence by police occurs and, and is directed at minority populations, we're left in a situation where the data we have says there's a problem and we still don't know the scope of the problem. We don't have any idea how often this is happening. But beyond that, if we really want to understand use of force how that relates to issues of policing and race, we, we want to go beyond just was force happening, yes or no, and start thinking about how and why force happened. We want to know, are there certain situations that we really need to think about in terms of police training? Are there certain environments that are really problematic? We want to know, do these training programs work, yes or no? Raw counts, statistical data, and I know all of my statistics students are like, he can't say that. Um, that's not that helpful. We need the context of behavior, and that doesn't exist. Acknowledging this, I have this quote up there from then Attorney General Eric Holder, and, that, and that's, I, I think, if you're interested in this topic and, and you think, wow, we really need to know how to change things, this is a troubling quote. And he says, the troubling reality is that we lack the ability right now to comprehensively track the number of incidents of either uses of force directed at police officers or uses of force uh, by police. We, don't, we, we really don't know what's going on in our community, and to the degree that we do know, we know limited knowledge only about lethal force. There's all sorts of force that isn't lethal, and that can also ruin police-community relations. So our ongoing challenge, if we want to think about revising public policy, is thinking about how we can do that in the absence of good data. Happily, I, I'm, I'm happy to report that there are folks here at Washington State University that are taking this problem seriously. And I want to just highlight some of the projects we do, we're, we're working on, and uh, talk about why we're going that direction. But this isn't just a, a, a WSU, this isn't just a WASU thing. Academics, researchers at other universities, researchers from within police departments, activist researchers, journalists, all sorts of people are also aware of this problem and investigating it. They want to know OK, what can we find out? How can we systematically document the presence of police bias, especially as it re relates to use of force? And from there, what can we do about it? So one thing that we're working on is looking at alternative data sources. Dr. Boyd actually presented alternative data sources. He had a mapping, uh, map police violence map up there. That's crowdsourced police data. So what does that mean? 
That means that once people started figuring out we don't have good data on police use of force, they said, this is the age of the internet. We can crowdsource anything. And they started building their own databases. They said, hey, I saw that incident in my city, and they started recording it and building a database. And so one of the things that I'm currently working on with some graduate students is looking at the quality of that data. People are using it, and I think it's absolutely clearly better than the default data, but we still don't know a lot about that data, how useful it is, what it's capturing, what it's missing. And uh, to WSU's credit, and to, to my benefit, uh, they, they supported me with research funding to do that. So the, a new faculty seed grant was provided to say, hey, this is a really important topic. Let's look at it more. Other folks have really focused on contextualizing the use of force by police. Um, some of my colleagues from criminal justice, they're also in nursing and medicine up at WSU Spokane, have been looking at simulated police violence incidents. So they bring police officers in, they run them through a high fidelity training situation, and they say, okay, when do police officers shoot? When don't they shoot? What seems to affect that? Now this research has been highly controversial. You can certainly talk about it if you'd like. But it at least pushes the, 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 the discussion forward and says, we can't just study the numbers and the counts. We have to look at the context of the situation. We have to look at the dynamics, the decision making that underlies this behavior. Acknowledging to some degree that, that um, lab experiments may not be the best tool for this, my colleague Dr. Macon started a complex social interaction lab. And there, working with, uh, with me, with Dr. Rachel Bailey, with some other folks from other universities as well, some graduate students, we're actually taking the step to look at actual police incidents. This is the era of body-worn cameras, dashboard cameras, cell phones, CCTV. Police community interactions are at a much higher rate than they've ever been recorded. That's data. And what we're suggesting is that one of the best ways to understand how police treat people, how race matters, is to look at the actual incidents, to code that data, to really dive into the world of policing in a way that you can't do with surveys, in a way that you can't do with existing statistics. And I, I mean, that work is just beginning. I, I think that it's probably going to be some of the most important work that I've done in my career. But the point isn't to dive into the specifics. The point is that there are a number of folks at Washington State University that take this issue seriously, that, that care about this issue, that want to understand and learn more about it. And that sort of element, that element of an interested party, as well as this sort of event, the, the, the Foley Institute hosting this event, these panelists coming out and sharing their views, that, despite being pessimistic about identifying easy solutions, gives me some hope that at least some segment of the population is interested and sort of dedicated to moving forward, because truthfully, from my position as an academic who studied th these issues, and I suspect you would hear the same thing from my panelists, this is going to be an ongoing challenge, but not one that we can wait for, one that we have to tackle hopefully sooner than later. Thank you. Join me now in thanking our panelists.